Last time on Abundant Life Today with Pastor Walter Hallam. You don't need to have anything uh, externally or internally that takes you out of your mental capacity where you cannot call the shots yourself. You don't need to booze it out. You don't need to dope it out. You don't need to hypnotize it out. Your mind was made for you to control you and your spirit man should be able to talk to your brain all the time. You ought to clap your hands because I'm preaching good. But I'd just like to tell you that when you study the Word of God and you praise the Lord and you magnify God, not only are you exhaling, but every time you say, I'm going to magnify the Lord, you're inhaling. And if the enemy tries in any way to get a hold on you, the Bible says, now listen, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So if the enemy tries to attach himself to you some way, you just do like the Apostle Paul said, and you just shake him off in the fire. things are an abomination unto the Lord. Well, look at verse 11. A charmer, a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or necromancy. Uh, it, does anyone know what a necromancer is? 
That's the worship of the dead. There are whole religions today that worship the dead, who pray to the dead. The Bible says don't do that stuff. I'm just going to let it sink in for a moment. I mean, it's real emphatic. Uh, You see it in more than one place. I just gave you one of them right there. Uh, Same devil, same Jesus, same principle, same rule, same spiritual force, same one who's for you, same one who's against you. So the body of Christ, don't, don't come off with this high-minded religious thing. People get real religious when they want to disobey the word of God and say, well, that's in the old covenant. So as thou shalt not kill. So as thou shalt not commit adultery. So as don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. Uh, we should be wise about those things. And just realize if we've been involved with some of that because of a lack of knowledge or a lack of training or understanding that we back off and we say, whoa, I've I've been wrong in this area. Holy Spirit, help me to be the kind of uh, father or mother or person or individual that I'm supposed to be as a Christian. And God, if there's areas that I'm supposed to embrace, I'll embrace them. And if there's areas I'm supposed to get rid of, I'll get rid of them. Help me, Lord, to see that and understand it. And, uh, you you know, the day you do that, something great begins to happen in your life. It's called growth. You begin to grow. And you begin to learn. You know, I had a wonderful mom and a wonderful dad. But, you know, as I I grew up and the more uh, that I grow up today, first of all, what I think they did that was wise is very, very wise. But, you know, even as a, a boy growing up, they weren't perfect parents. They were great parents. They just weren't perfect. And I I look back and I see things and I think, no, I don't think I want to do that. I don't agree with that. I don't think I'd do it. And and so I didn't. We made adjustments and we did, Cindy and I did things just a little bit different in uh, in some areas. Uh, One of the great days in your life is when you find out that whatever you inherited, everything about it is not necessarily good for you today. And so you just make that little adjustment. Let's say 90% of it is great. But what about that other part? That's where we make those little adjustments. There's things that we say we believe and we don't believe, uh, things that we do or we don't do, that we just kind of inherited patterns in our life. Well, we just back off of them. We just leave them alone. We just give them to God. We say, here, here, Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I just repent. I turn from that. Uh, and I'm just going to uh, receive what the Word of God says. And anywhere I have a void, I'm going to fill it with the kingdom of God and the ways of the kingdom of God. Come on, clap your hands one more time to God. Back to Acts 16 in conclusion. Watch this. Uh, Help me, LaShawn. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, on a a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination. The word divination right here in the the Greek is a very interesting word. Y'all ready for this? Say, I will never forget. Python. P-Y-T-H-O-N. It's the word python. It is a serpent. It's a spirit. Uh, It is, you know, the devil, of course, came to Eve in the garden as a serpent. And in the Old Testament, I mean, excuse me, in the book of Revelation, he is called that old serpent. Uh, The Bible calls him the dragon, the serpent. And more than one place in the scripture, you see where demons are called serpents. For instance, in in, uh, uh, Matthew uh, 28 or Mark 16, it says that you will... uh, uh, you'll lay hands on the sick, the sick will recover, uh, you'll take up serpents. Uh, and he goes on and he says, if you drink any deadly thing, it'll not harm you. He's not talking about being a snake handler like some goofy cult up in the top of a mountain somewhere. He's talking about if demonic forces come against you, uh, more than one place you see them call serpents. Uh, in the scripture, and the devil likes to, of course, disguise himself in that particular way. With that thought, if I see a snake, I'm going to kill him. Ever since the Garden of Eden, I don't like them. The other night, let me tell you a story. You want to hear a story? The other night, I was in the kitchen. I was in, the, in, in our kitchen, and we have a, a garage that joins our uh, back of our house right there by the kitchen. We actually have two kitchens because I eat a lot. So I have a big kitchen, and Cindy has a small kitchen. And uh, so um, it's kind of a little serving and warming area. And so anyway, and then you go out the back door, and you're right there where the, the cars in the garage are. So she said... Uh, I'm going to step out in the garage for a second. I've got to get something, and, which would be a miracle 
in itself the way I have that thing all cluttered up right now. But anyway, she said, I'm going to step out in the garage. I said, sure, okay, you know, or, or whatever. And so I'm just there in the kitchen, and the next thing I know, I hear, Walter, come here, Walter. This just happened. And it's one thing when she says, come here, big boy. It's another thing when they go, Walter. So you know that business is about to pick up. And you're like wishing your name wasn't Walter at that point because you know, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's not good. <laughs> and so I walked out there and there's a snake about this long that was laying. Uh, we have a, a big dark rug right there. And it was laying on that dark rug, I think, because it camouflaged it some. It's kind of a multicolored looking thing. Pretty good sized snake. And every time I tell it, it gets about six inches longer too. <laughs> And with, with teeth that long and fire out of its eyes and horns and everything. It was a bad snake. And uh, I do not like a snake. I don't mind telling you. I'll stop my car in the middle of the road, back it up, and just hit it three times to be sure. And somebody came to me one time and said, I can't believe you'd kill a snake. I'd say, oh, yeah, I'll get you the video. <laughs> you, you don't understand me. I, I don't have very many fears in my life, but I do not like a snake personally, so uh, I'm sorry if you do. So anyway, uh, there was that snake laying there, and she's go like, get it! <laughs> I'm looking for my phone. I want to call Josh. I'm like, Josh, hurry, get over here! <laughs> so I've got a hoe there in the, uh, it's like one of the things that have never been used in my, in my <laughs> garage, you know. There's a hoe there. I grabbed that hoe, and I don't mind telling you, man, I made that thing look like Vienna sausage before it was over with that. I did. Then I want to go hang it up on the fence to tell all the other little snakes, don't come around my house. Come around my house. I'm under my feet. I'll make shoes out of you. It came to pass as they went to prayer. Their many mate. A damsel, a woman that had a spirit of divination who met us, who brought her masters, uh, the, the Greek says her owners, she was a slave, which brought her owners much gain by soothsaying, by fortune telling, by witchcraft. She had a demonic spirit. It was called divination. The Greek is the word python. There's more than one kind of serpent in the Bible. I'm just going to say this, and then we'll pick this back up Sunday. There's more than one kind of serpent in the Bible. There are two kinds that are referenced. One of them is a, uh, is a constrictor, and the other, like a python, is a constrictor. It's not poisonous necessarily. Uh, the other is like a cobra, a striking snake, a viper. Uh, in, in Acts uh, 28, 27, 28, the Apostle Paul, you know the story. Uh, when he was on the island of Malta, Melita, the Bible says that right out of the, that wood that he was going to put on the fire came a, a serpent that struck him. And the fangs went way deep into his hand and he had to shake it violently to get it off of him. That's a poisonous thing and they thought he would die. Uh, and they thought anybody that got struck by one of those snakes, because they're so poisonous, that God had judged them. Of course, he didn't die. He lived, and revival broke out. Somebody shout hallelujah. And so, and right here is the word python, and a, a constrictor, like a boa constrictor or a python, is a snake that wraps around. They have, they're just a solid muscle, basically. And they wrap around and wrap around once they, uh, once they grab an opponent or a, uh, a victim of some kind, uh, uh, another animal, that's how they eat them, they will grab those things and hold them with their mouth, and then they will start wrapping and wrapping and wrapping all around them. And the more that thing struggles to try to get away, the way their teeth are, they just hold it. Their teeth are kind of opposite, so they, they're lodged on them like that. Don't y'all like, y'all watch National Geographic or... Y'all watch the animal planet or anything? And they're holding on to them like that. And these things are wrapping around them. And the more that that thing struggles, the more that snake constricts and constricts. And so every time that animal breathes and their lungs go down, it constricts. And then they breathe, but they got less breath. And then they constrict. And every time they exhale, it constricts. Until they finally get it so much that it can't inhale 
Therefore, it suffocates and dies. And that's how they kill them. They coil around them and just start tightening and tightening and tightening. Little at a time. Every breath. Every time they exhale. Until finally they've crushed them down. They don't even necessarily have to break a bone to do it. They just crush it down. So the lungs can't fill up. And they crush the air out of it. And by taking the air out of it, then of course it just ultimately suffocates. And then it becomes supper. I'd like to talk to you just for a minute about one of the most sensitive subjects that anyone can ever experience, and that's the loss of a loved one or a very strong tragedy when someone goes through that, how they hurt, how they're very pained on the inside, and how do they recover? Can they ever recover from the loss of a loved one? I've written a book entitled The Big Why, and in this book, the Lord began to talk to me about the four reasons that something bad can happen to someone who is good. I'm very experienced in this particular understanding. My beautiful daughter, who was 18 years old, died prematurely years ago in an airplane accident. And when she went to heaven, the Holy Spirit visited me and began to talk to me about that powerful experience, about heaven itself. And then God began to talk to me about the four reasons that something bad like that can actually happen to such a good person. Now, you may know someone who's going through a very difficult time, or you might be personally going through a very, very tragic time. If you get a hold of this book, listen, it may save their life. It may save your life. It might help you overcome pain that's almost too difficult to verbalize. It'll even tell you how to talk sometimes in those unique matters. So go right to the website at walterhallam.com. Get your copy for yourself or a friend, and I'm excited to hear about your recovery. The Bible says right here, and I close with this, uh, that this woman had a spirit of divination. And people would come and they would say, read my fortune. And every time she's speaking to them, she has a demon. She has a spirit. Every time she does, the devil's putting another wrap around them. And another wrap around them. And another wrap around them. How many of you know that Christians ought not be involved with things in this life? And I'm not even just talking about crystal ball reading and stuff. I'm just talking about life. Because the devil tries to attach himself. He'll try to get a portal. He'll try to get a foothold in your life in some area. And then he'll start wrapping around and wrapping around and wrapping around and wrapping around. Uh, he'll wrap around. Uh, the Bible says of this that she brought her owners much money. You can be sure the devil's always trying to wrap around your money and squeeze it out. I'm preaching real good right now. But he'll wrap around your marriage and try to, uh, to squeeze the love and the joy out of your family. He'll wrap around uh, your dream and your desire uh, to, to succeed at something. And he'll begin to, with fear and doubt and circumstance and with the conversation and, and with actions that maybe you wish you hadn't made, he'll begin to wrap and wrap and wrap and wrap and, and just wrap around and wrap around. And isn't it interesting that here they are, they're going on this, their first big missions journey like that. So Paul is stepping into a whole new realm of ministry. And as soon as he does, he meets somebody who can help finance it. And then he meets somebody else who's being used by the devil with their money. One of them's being used by the Lord with that royal, that purple. And the other is with Python, is with that demonic thing. You can be sure that when you begin to take new territory and you stretch your ministry, I know what I'm saying. I've only been pastor now for 31 years, but I can just tell you that every time we start to stretch and stretch ourselves a little bit, the devil will try to attack. He's always tried to do it, but the Bible says, give no place to the devil. And one of the things he'll try to do in any family, because today in our life, our, our whole world is around our economy. Used to it was around our garden. 
or it was around the barn or it was around, you know, some manufacturing thing that we did and, or the sawmill or whatever. But now everybody works for a paycheck. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give me two amens. Amen. And so the enemy tries to start just squeezing all of your money out of you and all the life out of it and, and they'll try to squeeze the air out of it. Now listen, air in the Bible, uh, that breath, that air, the Bible says that, that Jesus, uh, for instance, he, uh, in John, he breathed, John 20, he breathed upon his disciples and said, receive the Holy Ghost. That breath is a type of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, verse 4, suddenly, somebody shout suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled that place. You know, the devil's always trying to squeeze your air out of you. But I'd just like to tell you that when you study the Word of God and you praise the Lord and you magnify God, not only are you exhaling, but every time you say, I'm going to magnify the Lord, you're inhaling. And if the enemy tries in any way to get a hold on you, the Bible says, now listen, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So if the enemy tries to attach himself to you some way, you just do like the Apostle Paul said, and you just shake him off in the fire. That's why we don't let the devil squeeze our prayer life out of us, our Bible study, our studying the Word of God, our praising. We don't just put in all kind of uh, ugly songs and all that kind of stuff, listening to them all day long and not knowing what God is doing with new songs that are being written and uh, Christian songs, Holy Ghost songs, faith songs, worship songs, praise songs. Uh, we refuse to fill ourselves up with the latest top 40 of the world without knowing the top 40 of the kingdom of God. Amen. Otherwise, the enemy will just constrict and constrict and constrict in your life and then the next thing you know, uh, the, the devil will come and he'll say, well, it's okay to use your money another way. It won't make any difference. But every time you disobey God with your money, it's like the enemy has done this. But you've got to shake that off by obeying God and magnifying the Lord. Make that decision that you're going to obey the Lord. When you get under attack... I think it's real interesting that his, his ministry was stepping into something new right there. That two things happened, bam, bam. Both of them happened with women and money. One of them was being used by God in a royal way and the other one is defined in a demonic way. I hear the Holy Ghost talking to me right now about some stuff. It's very important to understand that. Hallelujah. 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 Not only does that take place right there, which I think is really interesting, but he defines him, calls him the python spirit, a python spirit. Uh, it, it, when you study a little about the python, you do understand it. As a pastor for these first 31 years, I've made a decision that I will not let certain things attach to me because if they don't attach to me, I don't have to worry about them coiling around me. And there's a lot of preachers that don't understand it. There's a lot of people that don't understand it. Uh, but I just do what I think the Holy Ghost said in those areas. Because I don't put myself in positions of compromise. Somebody said, uh, and they accused me this one time. They said, you just don't believe in women preachers. That's your problem. You're not friendly toward women. What? Talk to my wife and ask me if I'm friendly toward women. Ask my daughters if I'm friendly toward women. Ask the people who work for me if I'm friendly toward women. I'm very friendly toward women. Ask every person I know. I'm just not going to, there's just a certain limit there. And, and I'm not talking about anybody in here, but you have to be wise about that. I said you have to be wise about it. For instance, uh, uh, you have to guard what you see with your eyes. You have to guard what you listen to. You have to make some decisions in your own life not to let the enemy get a foothold and start trying to constrict your praise and your thoughts and your worship. There's a lot of people in the world that are very smart, and I like smart people. I've got very few real weaknesses like that in life, but I like smart people. I run with smart people. I like people. I have a very high IQ. They tell me I'm a genius. That's the first time I ever told you all that. When I test, I test very high, and I thank the Lord for that. 
uh, and I'm attracted to people who are very, very intelligent. That's why, I, like Cindy, she has a very high IQ when she's tested. Her IQ is very high. And I'm just attracted to that. But I'd just like to tell you this right now. Now listen, I don't care if they're smart or they're dumb. It doesn't make a lick of difference whether they're educated or not educated. If they do not have the Holy Spirit, if they do not have the, the glory of God, or if they reject it, even though they're intelligent, you have to use a lot of wisdom that whatever it is that you're involved in doesn't get a, a hold of you and start constricting faith out of you and understanding of the Word. The Apostle Paul said it like this, uh, and I think Paul was, uh, with, with, without a doubt, would be uh, considered a, an intellectual genius for sure in his day. And the Apostle Paul said, he said, look, I just decided to count it all as nothing. He said, I count all of that as nothing, that I can access the very purpose and the plan of God. He said, from now on, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll just come and preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified and believe God that He'll confirm it with signs following. Somebody shout hallelujah. Come on, let's give God the praise this afternoon. Thanks again for joining us on Abundant Life Today with Pastor Walter Hallam. I'd like to talk to you just for a minute about one of the most sensitive subjects that anyone can ever experience, and that's the loss of a loved one or a very strong tragedy when someone goes through that, how they hurt, how they're very pained on the inside, and how do they recover? Can they ever recover from the loss of a loved one? I've written a book entitled, The Big Why, and in this book, the Lord began to talk to me about the four reasons that something bad can happen to someone who is good. I'm very experienced in this particular understanding. My beautiful daughter, who was 18 years old, died prematurely years ago in an airplane accident. And when she went to heaven, the Holy Spirit visited me and began to talk to me about that powerful experience, about heaven itself. And then God began to talk to me about the four reasons that something bad like that can actually happen to such a good person. Now, you may know someone who's going through a very difficult time, or you might be personally going through a very, very tragic time. If you get a hold of this book, listen, it may save their life. It may save your life. It might help you overcome pain that's almost too difficult to verbalize. It'll even tell you how to talk sometimes in those unique matters. So go right to the website at WalterHallam.com. Get your copy for yourself or a friend, and I'm excited to hear about your recovery.